I want to welcome you to this unconventional exhibition and talk and reception. I'm Benton Jones, I'm the director of art. Uh, I say unconventional because normally exhibitions uh, are booked many months and even years in advance, while uh, the Boris Margot and Murray Zimely's co-exhibitions, A Ukrainian Sensibility in War in Ukraine, were presented with some urgency as they speak to their shared Ukrainian heritage and serve to bring greater awareness to the horrific consequences of the war in Ukraine. We would normally be closed today, so I'd also like to thank you all, uh, especially Murray and Martha, his wife, who came from upstate New York to bring Murray's horrible, beautiful, Ukrainian-themed works of art to our Cape Cod community. Murray Zimelis and his nephew uh, is the nephew of Boris Margot and is also the donor of the many of the Margot art artworks currently on display up in the PSD gallery. So an additional show of gratitude to you, Murray, uh, for making this large donation of art in 2001. The Cape Cod Museum of Art has been the steward of these important works for over 20 years now, but until now, these works have never been shown. It was the digitization project over this last summer that brought these works to our attention and the expertise of our conservation and framing volunteers, uh, Bob Nash and Henry Holkamp, that enabled this exhibition to materialize by matting and framing the prints. So I want to thank them as well. Murray Zimelis is a painter, printmaker, curator, and author. He was a professor of art at Purchase College State University of New York from 1977 to 2014. He achieved his BFA in painting and printmaking uh, from the University of Illinois and his MFA from Cornell University. He pursued the postgraduate study of printmaking at the Ecole Nationale Supérieure Beaux-Arts and at private workshops in Paris, leading to his co-authoring of two acclaimed books on the lithography printmaking technique. In 2007, he was elected as a member of the National Academy in New York. Zimelis was the guest curator of, of the American Folk Art Museum's exhibition and the author of the book, Gilded Lions and Jeweled Horses, uh, in 2008, uh, the book won the National Jewish Book Award for the Visual Arts category. <coughs> Zimeli uh, has participated in numerous solo and group exhibitions since 1965. He had a major exhibition of his Holocaust paintings, drawings, and prints at the Florida Holocaust Museum, which acquired 140 pictures executed from 1984 to 1991. In 2003, a mid-career retrospective of his paintings and drawings was held at the Neuberger Museum of Art in Purchase, New York. And uh, this retrospective exhibition traveled here to the Cape Cod Museum of Art in the same year. In 2016, his triptych painting, 9-11, was acquired by the 9-11 Memorial uh, Museum in New York City. Uh, his work is held wild, uh, widely within private collections and museum collections throughout the world, notably the Museum of Modern Art, the Brooklyn Museum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the National Collection in Washington, D.C. So please join me in welcoming Murray Zimelis. I'd like to thank uh, Benton and Yana for welcoming us and being such great hosts. And we had dinner last night, and it was an interesting conversation. And one of the things he mentioned was that, you know, I, I've spent most of my time in Provincetown, not so much in Dennis and Brewster, but one of the things he mentioned was that there were 23 billionaires living in Provincetown. So if any of you are billionaires, can you please stand up? <laughs> and if you are, you're now on the board of the Cape Cod Museum of Art. <laughs> Anyway, uh, what I'd like to do, be talking about Boris's work, <clears throat> is that he's been the great influence on me in my entire life, not only as, as an artist, but also as the person who, I guess, instilled in me certain values that to this day are critical to not only art making, but to life itself. And be, what I'd like to do is to put Boris's life in a context of both 
history and art, and <coughs> sort of tell you about him. He <coughs> was born in 1902 in a small town called Volochinsk in Russia at that time, but it's now Ukraine. And this town is right on the Polish border. And his father, to make a living, it was a poverty-stricken town, would sell eggs on one side and then buy eggs on one side and then bring them over and sell them on the other side to make a few pennies. And that was the way he made a living. Uh, I was in Volochinsk researching work that I actually ultimately became that museum at the uh, Folk Art Museum. Uh, <clears throat> and I went there. And it's a tiny little town, not too far from Lviv, and uh, very modest, very simple place, tiny little houses. And Boris's house, although I'm not sure which one it was, uh, I visited the street where it was on. And a lot of those houses, I mean, in those days, well, didn't have wooden floors. They only had sort of mud floors. And Boris always told me that his mother would decorate the mud floors. So maybe that was uh, what stimulated his interest in art. But in any case, <clears throat> in uh, 1919, I'm sorry, in 19, yeah, 1919, Boris won admission to the Polytechnique uh, of Art in, o in Odessa. <clears throat> and if you look at a, a map of Ukraine, you've got Lviv up here in the Polish border. Way in the corner down there is where Odessa is, which is on the Black Sea. It's quite I mean, I'll just guess about four or five hundred miles away. And the scholarship, which the town organized for him, because they thought he was talented, consisted of a bag of peanuts and a sack of salt. <laughs> and that sounds insane, right? But you have to understand at that moment in time, that's why I want to place it in the context of history, <clears throat> is that money was irrelevant, because it was right smack in the middle of a major war which was raging across Ukraine. You had uh, <clears throat> the Russian Bolsheviks, and you had the Russian um, and the Ukrainian and sort of Russian Cossacks, as well as the Ukrainian National Army, all fighting each other, and it was a mess. I mean, it was mayhem everywhere. People were starving. There was nothing really available. So those two commodities served as a way of traveling and selling off bits and pieces so he could get to the academy. He studied there for two years, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, in 19, let's see, I'm sorry, he, he was, actually I have to put him in context, he, remember he's 17 years old now. In 1919, that was in 1917, 1919, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 1924, he then gets a, a grant to study in Moscow at uh, the Futimas <clears throat> Art Academy, which was sort of an avant-garde place. Now, Russia at that time had two major sort of tillers that were pushing modern art. There was Malevich, which many, many of you may or may not know of, and this guy Filonov. <clears throat> and Malevich was mostly sort of in the Moscow area, and Filonov was in St. Petersburg. <clears throat> anyway, Bo Boris ultimately ended up in St. Petersburg studying with Filonov. And Filonov had this sort of way of working with, he said you only could use a tiny little brush and no big brushes and every little dot and mark you made with that little brush counted for everything. And he believed that painting was basically color drawing. But he also pushed an avant-garde aesthetic. And at that time, and ultimately what happened in Russia was that the aesthetic became social realism, which was a near catastrophe in terms of what happened to all these modern artists who were developing, and in fact, you, one, one could argue that Russia was the place in, in that whole period of time, and, and I said right after the revolution, 1917 through the 20s, which had the most avant-garde art going on. <clears throat> and influences from Italy arrived, futurism, and that was incorporated into the Russian aesthetic, and cubism as well. <clears throat> and Boris, meanwhile, was absorbing all this. But, he was also constantly confronted by these armies going across Ukraine, killing people, and uh, it, it was unbelievable. So he would tell me stories about things that so horrible that <clears throat> there were so many bodies, they couldn't bury them because of the cold. So they would take them to the railroad station, they would stack them up like cordwood, and people would go there with a tarp to look and see where their relatives were. 
I mean, it was that, and then the trains didn't run. I mean, there were military trains running all over the place, but basically trains didn't run, so to get from one part of that world to another was this, you know, incredible voyage. <clears throat> so anyway, so Boris is studying all this time in the midst of chaos, and he ends up in St. Petersburg studying with, uh, <clears throat> in 1929, at the Filonov Institute there. <clears throat> and he told me this incredible story of that, People were so hungry and starving, and Filonov had no shoes, so he would take cardboard and wrap rags around it, put the shoes on before he came to class. So all the kids chipped in to buy him a pair of shoes, and that was their Christmas present to him. And, and Boris made a little money delivering newspapers, and in those days, delivering newspapers meant there were no elevators, so you go up to the third and fourth floor, you carry your newspapers, dropped the newspaper off, and meanwhile he probably had one meal a day, so he was in, emaciated doing all this. But those few pennies he was actually able to save and chip in to buy his teacher a pair of shoes. So that, that, that's, that's the environment that he was educated in. So it's important to understand that. <clears throat> so anyway, eventually <clears throat> he ends up, he ends up at uh, the Analytical Institute and gets a scholarship or I should say a grant to study the work of, and, and this is, you know, we're, we're in St. Petersburg now, to study at the Hermitage, the studies of Bruegel and Bosch. And he convinces them that he has to go overseas to, to look at work of Bar Bar Bruegel and Bosch. And they allow him to do that because at that time, it wasn't very easy to sort of go anywhere. I mean, no one was given permission to go anywhere. So <clears throat> that was the way he got out of Russia, or Ukraine in this case. Anyway, he arrives, I guess, in steerage. <clears throat> he arrives in Cuba because he couldn't get into America because of all the laws that the U.S. passed. I think it was, what, in 1924, these exclusion laws that were passed in America, excluding all Eastern European people, basically. Uh, so he ends up in Cuba, eventually ends up in Montreal doing mural work, and finally comes to the United States. <clears throat> So he's in America in 1930, and uh, he, he arrives knowing no one, basically, and he gets in contact with Rorick. Does anyone know who the Rorick is? He was sort of this mystic, and uh, he had a school in New York, and obviously he's a Russian, spoke Russian. So Boris goes to Rorick, and Rorick looks at his work, I mean, to study with Rorick, studies with him for two years, and then is hired as a professor there. And that's the beginnings of him able to sort of make a living and live in the United States. Meanwhile, his family is still in Ukraine. And uh, to backpedal a little bit, in, in those days in St. Petersburg, since there were really is no way, no real communications, any new person who walked, came into the town would go to this big sort of wall and put down, you know, something that happened, some information that happened in various towns across Ukraine or Russia at that time. And Boris would, would check that area, and one day he sees pogrom in Volochinsk, which is where his family is. <clears throat> so he decides he has to go back to see if they're alive or not. So this is, you know, now he's in St. Petersburg, which is on the, what is it, the Finnish border, right, way up there. And he's now going all the way back to Volochinsk, which is on the Polish border. And the way he got there was these army trains are going back and forth. So he would, <clears throat> he would hang out at the station, and he was very good with his hands. He whittled a little chess set and was able to trade the chess set with soldiers for a place in, underneath their bunks. And, you know, they would, they, the soldiers were fed or else they couldn't fight. So the soldiers would eat, and they would drop like a bone of chicken or something so that he would stay alive under the seat. Finally, after they got the chess set, they threw him off the train. So he jumped between the two cars, and it was very cold and it rained that night, and he was like frozen like an ice cube, you know, in between the two cars, and he was able to sort of break out of it and all that. Anyway, he finally, through means like that, arrives in Volochinsk, and the station master there knew him as a little boy and says that, you know, your, your parents haven't heard from you in years. They don't know if you're alive or you're dead. And uh, so he then tells him <clears throat> that I came because I read there was a pogrom, and the station master describes the pogrom of the Cossacks riding their horses into the town, you know, stealing, burning, raping, 
taking children, you know, on their horses, they were very proud of smashing them against the wall and stuff like that. The family <coughs> survived, fortunately. And uh, the, the, the homecoming was very dramatic, wonderful. Anyway, that, that, that's one of the stories he told me. So, we should get to his work a little bit, <coughs> since that's what we're all about here. Oops. That's Boris on the right. And, uh, <coughs> Boris, at the beginning, was, one could argue, one of the most avant-garde artists in America. And uh, he, <coughs> during the Second World War, when all the Surrealists, a lot of the Surrealists came to America, the one person they wanted to see was Boris, because he had this sort of reputation of being a Surrealist, and uh, his work, oh, this, this is the, the very famous photograph, which Boris is not in, and uh, he hated groups of, you know, sort of artists sort of hustling each other. Actually, sometimes they were just doing lectures and all that. This is from the artist club at that time. And they asked him to be in this picture. And one of the biggest mistakes for professional reasons in his life was refusing. Because when you look at who was in that picture, it reads like, who's who in American art? And uh, Boris is not in it, which is too bad. But he was asked to be in it. Um, <clears throat> this guy here. Max Ernst. And Max Ernst is one of the more famous artists in that group. And he used a technique in the 40s called decalcomania. Decalcomania is when you take two surfaces, it could be gouache, could be oil, but if you take two, two surfaces and put a lot of paint on them and with some you know medium on them, squish them together like this, pull them apart, it ends up making these squishy sort of sponge-like, really interesting, beautiful marks. And Max Ernst incorporated that technique in some of his most famous work. And he was, was told by Jimmy Ernst, his son, who had a gallery, and was, sh was showing Boris's work, that Boris had invented it. And Max Ernst said, that's not true. And then Jimmy Ernst said, it is true. And this is a huge crowd of people at the opening of the show. And uh, this all comes from a book that Jimmy Ernst wrote called Not So Still Alive. And Max didn't talk to his son because he embarrassed him for three or four years after that. And anyway, the, the technique he was using was invented by Boris Margo. <clears throat> so, that's, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way. And there's a, there was an interesting exhibition Boris shared a studio with Mark Rothko for many years. And most, as some of you who are from Provincetown probably know that Mark Rothko had a house there, not too far from Atkins Bay alone, where Boris's house was. And then this, this book here is from a major exhibition called American Artists from the Russian Empire. And this is at the Russian State Museum in, in Russia. And the pictures I'm going to show you come from this book. Again, this is an attempt to put Boris in an artistic context. So, this is a Mark Rothko from that book. And if I remember that correctly, the date, so 1940 something, 41, if I'm not mistaken, or 42. This is a Boris Margo of the same period, uh, the same 1941 42. This is interesting because this image is based on him being on the dunes in Provincetown and looking at driftwood. So, all this. Is, is based on driftwood. All this stuff here. And this is another Mark Rothko of the exact same period. And remember, they're, they're friends and they know each other. And this is not the Rothko you know of those big rectangles, color field pictures. So I'm just showing you in terms of what I consider is a far more avant-garde stance in art of Boris versus his friend, actually, but right here's the first, this is the first example of decalcomania. This picture is dated, this is all decalcomania, all this here, all this sort of squishy stuff. And somebody said, all this down here, and this here, that's all decalcomania. 
and Bohr's invented that in 1935. It was used by a lot of French artists. In fact, when the Surrealists came to America, one of the reasons they wanted to see Boris was because of this. And as I said earlier, Max Ernst incorporated that in some of his major works. So, actually, Boris was quite friendly with a whole bunch of sort of avant-garde artists at that time. And there was Herschel Gorky. Actually, he, I, mean, I think back on it, he made the wrong friends. I mean, Rothko slashed his wrist in the bathtub and committed suicide. And, and Gorky, his other friend, hung himself. So, you know, Boris fortunately didn't do any of those things. But it was quite a crew at that time. And I remember as a child, walking down on University Place in New York, I was with Boris, he was holding my hand, and this sort of drunken guy came up staggering over to him. And I hid behind him because I was frightened. And he, this guy said, Boris, Boris, and he gave him a big hug. And uh, Boris says, you know, I'd like you to meet my nephew, Murray, and this is Bill de Kooning. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I met Bill de Kooning. But, but anyway, there are many stories like that from Boris, and I'll tell you one more, which I think is a sort of fun. Boris and Gorky would go to the, <clears throat> muse, uh, go to the beach, and Gorky was this you know, sort of skinny, tall Armenian guy. He was very hairy. So, you know, they were both kind of surrealists, so they would go to Jones Beach and they would bury Gorky and just let his head stick out and the hair from his chest. And, and it would attract a lot of attention. And that was the way they tried to pick up girls, is sort of... <laughs> I mean, you know, in those days the art world was very small, it was tiny, and everyone sort of knew each other. It's not unlike, you know, unlike today where everybody is an artist, it seems to be that way. There are thousands, thousands of artists. The world is, you know, overwhelmed with artists. In those days, everyone sort of knew each other. And, and there weren't that many major exhibitions. And when there were, like the major show that Peggy Guggenheim, Peggy Guggenheim had a gallery called the Art of the Century Gallery, and uh, Boris had a show there. It was a major exhibition. So all this is the world that Boris lived in. And <clears throat> as I said, unfortunately, he never was a promoter and never was part of that, that kind of, you know, publicity thing in Life Magazine with Dick Pollock and all that. But the museums recognized who he was, and they started buying his work. So <clears throat> in 1930-35, I mean, no one really knows, <clears throat> Boris was walking down the street one day, and uh, it was a big garbage can full of film, you know, old, you know, plastic film. And in those days, that film caught fire, so they didn't want to keep it around a lot, because for some reason it was very volatile. So Boris, you know, this is plastic, and today plastic is pervasive, but at that moment it was a new material. You know, not many people knew what this stuff was. So he gathered all this stuff up, found out that the company that made it was called DuPont, wrote them a letter and asked him, what is this stuff? So DuPont sent him a gallon of acetone, which they said could dissolve the stuff. So Boris took all this stuff, dissolved it in acetone, and found out that it created this wonderful viscous liquid, which he was able to pour, and he got like a, like a sort of a plastic kind of ketchup bottle, and he would squeeze it out, pour all sorts of shapes and images, and when it dried, it was in high relief, and it was very strong. <clears throat> so he started playing with it, and uh, eventually, <clears throat> Eventually, this isn't a print, this is a painting, but he started sort of playing with it, and I'll go back to this. Oh, this is interesting too. Again, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have shown you this before because this, again, there's the calcomania here, all this, and this painting dates from 1939, and all this stuff here. And 1939, as I, as I said, is... Uh, no one was working like this in 1939. I mean, everyone was into sort of a very different aesthetic. So this is the beach, which this is a shack. Yeah, this one, this is, I'm trying to think, you know, this one's still there. It's been remodeled by the Peacock Hill Trust. But uh, the previous shacks, this is, this is where I was raised as a child. <clears throat> the previous shacks, well, actually, when he first went to Provincetown in 1940, he uh, stayed in the old Coast Guard station. And uh, actually, Eugene O'Neill was in a Coast Guard station there as well, but he was in the Coast Guard station, in the boathouse of the Coast Guard station. <clears throat> and that, that had to end. 
so then, you know, in those days, people didn't care. They went on the dunes and they just did what they wanted. And so he went to the beach and found all this driftwood and built himself a shack. And he wanted a great view, so he built it right at the edge of the cliff, which was a big mistake. <laughs> because it fell into the sea. And then he built another one just a little bit further back, and that one fell into the sea. So he finally got the message and <laughs> decided that he would build one a bit further back, which is the one you see, which is now remodeled, which is still there, and which I go to every summer. <laughs> Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the exhibition upstairs. They put them in sort of an art artistic con context as well as, you know, a historical context. So these are the prints he did before he started working with Selicut. And uh, the Selicut is an interesting technique because it's, the, it, it's basically the technique that started high relief printmaking in the world. Because prior to that, everything was planographic, it was smooth, and it was like, like this, which is an etching. I mean, the techniques were basically wood blocks, etchings, screen printing, <clears throat> and lithography. Th those were the major things that were being done in America, in fact, all over the world. And so Boris's technique was an eye-opener. And all of a sudden, it, it, it created a, a sensation. And the Brooklyn Museum, which probably has one of the finest print collections in, in the world, is for sure in the United States, when you went there, they always have these sort of stanchions which had definitions of different techniques. So there's one for etching, there was one for woodcut, there was that, and it was also one for silica. So they recognized that those were the key major printmaking techniques. And, you know, being a printmaker, at least being known as a printmaker, is a double-edged sword for a painter. Because Boris's career took off like crazy when this technique was created, because immediately the Metropolitan bought a pit, bought bought some, and Brooklyn Museum bought some, et cetera, et cetera. So like literally right across the world, right across, and abroad as well, right across America, they were purchasing his prints. And then, you know, the Met put him on, they had used to have these jury shows, and he was on the jury of the Metropolitan. So here he is taking off. Meanwhile, he's also showing his paintings at the Betty Parsons Gallery, which is probably the most important gallery in New York. And uh, eventually, Sidney Janis decided to set up a gallery and started stealing some of Betty's artists. And the artists that Betty was showing were Rothko, people like that. And But Boris, always being I don't know, true to Betty, stayed with her until the gallery closed. I think it was in 1982, right to the end, so to speak, of that gallery. And Betty Parsons, <clears throat> she was a very interesting woman. She was well-to-do, so she could afford to keep the gallery open no matter what and uh, was never very pushy and never really sort of promoted her, her, her people very much. Sidney Janis, who was a shirt salesman, and a very wealthy shirt salesman, was the opposite. And he got on the board of the, of the Modern and started promoting all these exhibitions, begged Boris to leave Betty, when most of the other artists who had already done that, he refused. So, so he was angry at him and all that, so stopped promoting some of Boris's work. And... Uh, you know, again, as I say, Boris was never someone to push, his, push himself. But he stayed true to Betty. And Betty, of course, you know, wasn't like a disaster. And his work went into like 100 collections across America. <clears throat> anyway, so here's an etching. And some of, the, some of the forms that you see are then later translated into three dimensions. And these kinds of forms here. <clears throat> There's another etching that you see these forms. And again, a lot of these forms derived from driftwood, from the great beach of Provincetown. And here, these are some early experiments in silicate. And what silicate does is what the, when, the plastic, when the plastic dries, it ends up creating these ridges right here. And so this is a blob of it. But even the blobs themselves, it's hard to see, you know, unfortunately, you really have to look hard upstairs at some of the prints. And these shapes here, these simple shapes, are cardboard cutouts that are then varnished over and rolled up with ink. You'll see a lot of that after. And here, this is the, this is the cellar cut in the calligraphy. So the calligraphy. And so here, too, you have, again, all this... Is, and, and, and you know it's sort of like you know Pollock dripped through things and all that. 
and Boris was a pourer, <laughs> not a dripper, a pourer. <laughs> And so once, once again, if you analyze this, you'll see that the celicut part is here. This rectangle here is all cardboard. And so these are separate plates. So he would print this in, I guess, you know, and then it's hard to explain. It's almost easier to demonstrate, but that's not possible. But, you know, if you have, if you have a blank piece of paper and you print the cardboard first, you end up with that reddish color. But right, then you send it through the press a second time, and you print it, and you end up with some of this back here. Then you print the celicut at the end in these spaces. So this is like a three-color print. And you see that as they progress, they get more colorful in some ways. And some of these textures, which are hard to see here, but I'm just guessing because it, it, at first, I thought we would be upstairs just walking around the gallery. I could point things out very specifically. But a lot of this, this texture here is sand. He would just put sand on, a, on the surface of a piece of cardboard, varnish over it, make it stick, and then roll it up with a roller. And that would become one of the, one of the plates. And then he would, so a lot of this is sand, all this, celicut, all this. And again, cardboard here. So you have three, te three techniques happening simultaneously. This is mostly just celicut. But here he's beginning to, and you know, also because it's high relief, you see sort of a jump in colors. Like the colors aren't flat. Oops. Go back. The colors aren't flat. And so like when you roll over this, it sort of jumps and creates these blobs of color because this is all high relief. And here as well, you have, this is mostly silica here. These are shapes that he cuts out. So now, now, now you have cardboard shapes, you have these kinds of shapes up here, and the silica is there. And these, these are rolled up images, meaning rolled up, you know, like, instead of, like with an etching, you sort of ram the ink into the grooves, then you wipe the surface and you print it. In this case, it's just there's no, no wiping at all. It's just layers upon layers of color interacting with each other. Again, these, these jumps here are created by the, by the roller jumping over the high relief process here. And again, here are the shapes that he cuts out, and then sell a cut all through here. You know, it, it's hard to talk to them, to talk about these without actually pointing out specific little areas. But upstairs, later on, if we, uh, you know, go upstairs if some of you are interested, I can point out very specifically how, how they're made. This gets, gets more elaborate. And some of these, you know, he actually reverts to a quasi flatter surface, even though they're known for their dimensionality. And then later on, when you get to the white on white ones, which are very hard to see in, in photographic form, uh, he gets into very high relief. And the high relief extends not only to the, the actual prints, but it extends to sort of furniture he made and reliefs he made. And so he would make these wonderful chairs. And then he created his own language. Sometimes there'd be an English word that you could recognize. Sometimes the, 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 the calligraphy looks like it's, you know, I don't know, Chinese or whatever. But it's, it's his own language which he created. In fact, at the end of his life, he started calling himself Voda, which means water, because he felt like there's a certain serenity. And that serenity started to extend into his, his work later on where color gets minimalized and decreases until eventually this is part of a group called the Months, and it's a beautiful series and it's a, the Whitney had a major exhibition of them oh about 10 years ago in fact the Whitney had an exhibition called abstract art in America and the show started with one of Boris's major paintings <clears throat> so you know it's it's 
it's interesting that he's kind of everywhere, but he's also not there, <laughs> which is sort of sad. But this is a, one of the monks. This is another one. And these structures here, oops. These structures here start, I mean, some of them later on start coming out of buildings in New York. Where he sort of, you know, the, the structural skyscrapers are going up around where his studio was. And so he started looking out the window. And not so much here, but later on you'll see some of those influences there as well. But these cellar cuts, again, are, as, as I pointed out before, these are the cellar cut areas right in here, right in here, all this pouring and shapes. So, so the, the, I assume you understand the techniques now. So you have a flat piece of cardboard that's rolled up in ink, sent through the press. Then a cellar cut form is put on top of that, inked on top of that same plate, put through the press. So you end up with those jumps from the second color based on the first color. And yet, in some areas, because it's high relief, there's a white outline because the rollers can't get ink in there. Well, these are very hard to see, so I'm going to skip through them because it's almost impossible to sort of talk about them. But here, he's using a lot of, around some of these things, he's using a lot of other things like oatmeal, sand, anything he can find there of, any, of interest that can give him a different kind of a texture. <clears throat> and this is his, his language is beginning to be shown here, this little also here. But this, this here, all this back here, this is all silica in here. And so, and this is, I, if it's textured, it's probably sand or oatmeal. And this is his language here. And there's one that's not in this show, which was an homage to JFK and uh, when Kennedy was assassinated. So <clears throat> you see, JFK there, and then this other language, and people go crazy trying to figure out what does that say, you know, because that, that's a J and that's an F and that's a K. <laughs> it's, it's very hard to see these, and so I'm going to race through them. And here's more of his language right up here. This is actually quite nice. It's sort of, a, I think it's called the wall, if I remember correctly. And it looks like, you know, it's sort of a wall, but again, very high relief. This one is beautifully textured here. But just look very carefully when you go upstairs. You'll be able to really read these things. <clears throat> I'm going to transition from that show to my work. And uh, rather than <clears throat> just only talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about what preceded my work for the Ukraine, because uh, I interact with what happens around me sort of worldwide. So if something terrible happens somewhere and it catches my interest, I'll try to make a picture about it. So. But not always, not everything I do is about a catastrophe or a war, or about murder or whatever, but some of it is. And uh, these are sort of simple, I mean simple in the sense that they're not about those kinds of issues. This is uh, Italy. So this sort of landscapes, I've been spending traveling in Italy a fair amount of time and, and so ended up with some of these landscapes which are based on sort of an idea of futurism, sort of a modern version of futurism, and the issues I'm most interested in are uh, light, color, and movement. You know, it's interesting, it, it's sort of fascinating when you we look at a, an empty white canvas, it's crazy making, because, you know, you don't want to make it dirty, but at the same time, if you don't make it dirty, nothing happens. So, so sometimes I'll throw stuff on it, you know, pour stuff on it, print stuff on it, you name it, just to get it dirty. And then I look into the dirt, and I find things, and then I make things, and sometimes there are ideas there that go beyond 
the theme that just sort of happened because they have to happen. And uh, at a certain point, the theme leaves and the painting takes over, meaning aesthetics override the narrative. So this is Italy. This, uh, this is like three towns on top of each other. But at the same, but at the same time, you have, you, know, vine you, know, you have vineyards and tree I mean, fruit trees. These are the towns on top of each other. And sort of a way of, you know, but, but they're all sort of moving and dancing. And, and have, have any of you ever seen the polio? These, yeah, these are they're, they're, well, it depends. As I said, some of them I start with with all sorts of stuff, which I usually start with ink or uh, acrylic, you, you name it, it's on there. But basically, the oil and mixed media on canvas would be the way to describe it. Have any of you ever seen the polio? Well, you know, the polio is an Italian race that holds in Siena twice a year, and it's totally corrupt. <laughs> I, mean, I say it's corrupt because uh, riders are paid to sort of beat, beat other riders or throw them off horses, and it's sort of a violent, crazy race. But it's very popular, and 20,000 people come and sit in the center of Siena, and uh, they watch this. And there's a lot of pageantry, medieval pageantry. It starts out with uh, the Italian police all dressed up on their horses, riding around in a circle, then come the flag throwers, and, you know, and each, each area of, the, each part of Siena competes with another part of Siena, it's like different parts. <clears throat> anyway, each one has an old, their own flag, and they march, and they do these spectacular calisthenics almost with the flags, it's really cool, quite stunning. But it's, a, it's an, a crazy race, and it doesn't matter whether the rider is on the horse when it finishes. If the horse finishes, that 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 that, court, that, 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 that part of, wins. <clears throat> so they're beating each other and going crazy, and it's and it's very. It, actually, people get hurt because the turns are very severe. So my idea was to show this kind of intensity and movement of the polio. This is another one, and up here. These are birds of prey, which sort of represent the corruption. <laughs> <laughs> and in front of our house, in where we live, that's where the Millbrook hunt. And this is a uh, these people impersonating British aristocracy, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they all meet there. And I always found that the, the hounds are far more interesting, and the hounds and the horses are far more interesting than the people on them. <laughs> And so these are images from a hound's point of view, so to speak. <laughs> and that's another one of, of that. So the hounds are the chief protagonist, and the horsemen are back here, hanging, you know, almost irrelevant. Now, for about 13 years, I worked on this subject, and. It's complicated as to why I started it, but uh, my stepmother is considered a survivor, and uh, I was sort of tormented as a child by her, and in some cases, Holocaust survivors come out angelic, and sometimes they come out quite bitter. Unfortunately, in my case, it was sort of a very bad situation. So I was living in kind of poverty, and my father hardly ever worked because he couldn't get a job. When he came to America, he he couldn't speak English, so so the people he sort of interacted with told him he should become a furrier because the, the Fur and Leather Workers Union was a Jewish union run by communists. <clears throat> and uh, he decided, well, he'd become a furrier. Well, in the fur trade at that time, everyone became a specialist. And if you're, a, a, I don't know, into mink, you would only do mink. Persian lamb, you'd only do Persian lamb. And he decided he would do Persian lamb. And he was what they call a nailer. Stretch the furs with his hands, nail them up, stretch them out, and would come home at night. The dye in the animal skins was so intense that the only way he could wash his hands was with lemon juice. So he washed his hands with lemon juice. Anyway, the first fake fur of any importance was Persian lamb. So that immediately destroyed 
<coughs> his living, kind of. And then he never got a job after that other than pickup jobs, like running a pressing machine in a laundry and stuff like that. So we, we lived very poorly, and my stepmother could never accept that. And uh, her family was totally destroyed. And it was, it was a very bad situation. Anyway, so things like that came along, and I kept thinking to myself, especially when my son was born, that all this horror would be in my brain, and it would be inflicted the way it was inflicted on me, maybe it would happen to him. And I decided I had to sort of purge all this. And the only way I knew how to purge this was through art. So for 13 years, I thought it would be like just a, three or four pictures and it would be over. It kept, kept going. So <clears throat> these are a series. All of these, as was mentioned in the introduction, 140 of them are in the Holocaust Museum in St. Petersburg in Florida. They, they acquired the whole collection. And I, I should say, well, this is, actually, this happened in Romania. Uh, this is the Iron Guard went around <coughs> killing Jews like crazy. And one of the ways they decided to really do it was to kill them in an abattoir for pigs to insult them in death. And so, you know, this is one image here of, next to the pigs. And in the ghettos, this is the way they would bury people. Just on the shoot. And my poor wife was the model for some of this stuff. I feel sorry for it to this day. But these were the axioms, these are... And then there's a... A lot of these turned into... Uh, oh, this is, this is interesting because it's a... This is an ant. This is a. Oops, this, is a yeah. this here is uh, the bones of an animal I found in sort of a, a roadkill, and it was glued on there. And the museum refused to show it. They've had many shows of this. It works in St. Petersburg because it was an animal. And I actually just got a letter from them about six months ago saying they've changed their policy and they're able to show this picture. And there's a whole series of fire burning, you know, the burning synagogues and what happened, and Kristallnacht and all that. And, uh, is that? and the Book of Fire is uh, probably, some people say, the largest artist, you know, artist book. There's a whole category of, of artist books ever created because it's, depending on how it's shown, it's about 40 or 50 feet long, depending on how it's shown. And it's basically eyewitness accounts of what happened when the Nazis went into these towns and destroyed them and the people in them. And these are some plates from, these are all lithographs. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not, there's also a woodcut pasted on here. The rest is lithograph. So I, I, I'm not going to spend much time talking about this because I just want to sh show you that I get involved with various issues. Every lecture is nightmare. <laughs> This is the 9-11 triptych. This is in the 9-11 Museum in New York. Uh, when that happened, it kind of really, I mean, upset, upset the whole country, but it really for somehow had a profound effect on me because I went down there. In fact, I took my son down there about two weeks after it happened, and it was like a warscape. And I don't know if any of you had, were down there and ever saw what happened there, but the stench alone was terrible. I mean, burning wires and... Anyway, after I saw that, I just had to make some sort of statement about it. So these are, these are the, I, I used, you know, a dog is sort of an insult in 
I guess, in Islam. And so these are the ten terrorists as dogs, the dogs of war or whatever, or what you like there. And when Notre Dame burned, I felt like I should, you know, I spent time at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris, and uh, on Sundays I'd go to Notre Dame, not so much for religious reasons, but I went there for the pageantry, and it's spectacular and beautiful, and then later on for concerts. So when I watched it burn down, it was on TV, live TV, it really deeply affected me. So this is, these are 40 by 60, so this whole triptych is about 10 feet long or so, and about uh, 5 feet high. And in the 20th anniversary of 9-11, which is fairly recently, I did this picture. And again, Black Lives Matter, which is obviously quite recent, I did a painting of this. And finally, where, where we're supposed to be. <laughs> The way I went about these pictures, I felt like they had to be kind of documentary on some level. So they're not as abstract as some of the other pictures I do, because I felt like it, it was important to sort of very clearly state what was going on there, even though a lot of this is imagined and invented. And uh, so I would try to find images online that were real, and then place them in a context that make them intense. And when we talk about, you know, horrible, beautiful, I try to make them quote-unquote beautiful, like beautiful colors, all that, to attract people to look at them. So when you look at them, all of a sudden you realize what the content is, and then it brings home the message. So that was the, the idea, is to make them as, as, well, gorgeous as possible, if there is such a thing. And, and a lot of these images, like, like, this here is all invented, this tank, sort of a tank, like I said, but this is invented, no, but this I found online, which I thought was very powerful, and this is a little, this lady here is a fat card of uh, protesting the war in St. Petersburg. I thought it would be important to put at least one, one bit of the Russians themselves protesting the war. This is, this is sort of invented, this, all this. And what was horrible is I read that the Russians were leaving their soldiers just lying there if they were killed. And so, uh, to sort of dignify their, their bodies, I put a Russian flag on top of it. And these, these are just sort of tanks and I don't know, it's just, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a winterscape, which obviously hasn't really happened until recently, so I don't know, maybe there'll be some sort of battle that will end up looking like this, I don't know. This here is the Polish border, right here. And this little boy, he became kind of well-known because he was, on his body they wrote a message saying who he was and where he was from. And they sent him off on his own because his parents were either killed or they couldn't go. So he arrived at the Polish border all by himself. Just, and it kind of broke my heart. And then the people with the little dogs. I mean, people escaping with their animals. You know, I have a cat, and a cat means a lot to me. So I can understand that and not to have your animal, to have leave your animal behind is horrible. And then, you know, this, these horrors that keep occurring. And these old people who can barely walk are struggling across the border. It's just heartbreaking. It's and this never happened. I mean, the national symbol of Ukraine is the sunflower. When I was there, it was just at that time when they were all <coughs> in flower. And it's one of the most extraordinary sights I've ever seen. It's like, imagine almost sunflowers right to the horizon maybe 10 miles of sunflowers, nothing but sunflowers. And it's in, it, it almost hurts your eyes, it's so beautiful. And then to imagine this horror here, these images are, are, well, some of them are, these here, 
This is an image I basically found online. And these are invented, kind of, as a little group. And this, this is all, I don't know, just sort of beautiful Ukraine. Ukraine is a beautiful place. I spent, I spent some serious time there. And there are parts of Ukraine that would be major tourist sites. And, and to see this happening there, and at least to imagine this happening, I don't know if this ever happened, but it's unfortunate. And you know, people lived underground. It was interesting. I started reading about how these musicians would go underground and entertain them. And that sort of, again, affected me deeply. Just to see, and then above, you know, you have this going on. This is just, you know, normal people trying to survive with this kind of insanity behind them. And that's all over Ukraine. I just read today that they, the Russians started bombing the cities again. And in Kiev, they just hit an apartment building, which, you know, I don't know how many people died, but many did. And then this, this lady with, with an animal, sort of a like prison-like place. And then there's this wonderful sort of concert. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? I mean, maybe people have some questions you want to ask or comments or whatever. How long did it take you to go to the people? A lot of people ask me that, and there's really no answer because if things are going well, they'll take a couple of weeks. If they're not, they could take a couple of years. <laughs> I mean, uh, rarely, sometimes, but hardly ever. I, I kind of like to plow through and just just confront it and make it happen or it ends up in the garbage. <laughs> Both. Sometimes when I start the pictures, they're flat to throw things on, spill things on, print things on, just to get them dirty, as I said earlier, just to get them going. And the, it, it's rare that I have a... I usually have a clear idea for part of it, and then the rest sort of develops, and then it relies on what's next to it, kind of. I mean, one of the people always ask, why have you never done any abstract paintings? And I always say, well, it's, you know, a lot of these things, earlier works approach that. And I keep saying is that because at a certain point, I end up making decisions that are based on, you know, this looks nice next to this. And I don't want to do that. I want it to be important as opposed to being decorative. And uh, I remember one day, I was contacted by a lady who was putting together a collection of large drawings for AT&T for a building they were building in Westchester County. And I had a studio when I was teaching at Purchase, they gave us these lovely studios, which I would have some work in. So I invited her over <coughs> and said, look, come come to college and, you know, show you the work. So there was a barrier between where my office was, where I could meet students, and where I was doing my work, so she couldn't see the work when she arrived. So she arrives, she's very beautifully dressed with New York Times under her arm. She's all excited. She says, oh, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> and I said to her, I said, do you have any sort of guidelines that you have to follow? She says, oh, yes. I said, well, what are they? And she said, no sex, no religion, no violence. No, she's li listing what's not possible. No sex, religion, violence, what else is she saying? Oh, politics, no sex, religion, violence. So I said, can I see the New York Times? She said, yeah. And I said, on the page, I think the Pope was visiting something, so there was a religion. And, you know, sex is like, of course, everywhere. <laughs> and violence, you know, I, mean, I went to her and said, this is a life in, you know, a day in the life of America. And everything on this front page, I can't make pictures about. And she says, well, I never thought of it that way. I said, well, you should think about it that way. <laughs> and then, you know, and back. <laughs> The painting, I, the drawing, I was going to use huge drawings, which I'm not showing you, but they were like those Holocaust drawings. Those, those, you know, those were all done in pencil. Or, and it was one of the Rape of Europa. <laughs> so she went back there. She said, oh, my God, what's that? And I, said, I said, it's the Rape of Europa. She said, oh, I can't take that. And I said, well, obviously you can't take that. You can't take anything. I said, well, what can you buy? She said, she said landscapes. And she said, abstraction, of course. Landscape abstraction. And she said, Still lives. 
that's what she could buy. So I said, well, I'm unfortunately, but she's, but I like your work. I said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> You know, I mean, the old world is a very peculiar place. <laughs> Any other questions? I, thank you, first of all. Uh, at some point, <clears throat> excuse me, in his career, did he decide to shorten his name? Because I imagine yes, his name was Margolis. 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 And uh, his wife, who was very worldly, a Yale graduate, said, that's not a good name to have. So you should just cut off the uh, oldest part and just make it Margo. I, I have a cousin who my name is, is like peculiar. People don't know what I am. So uh, so he he's a big finance guy. And he changed the name from, his name is Paul Z. Period Miles. <laughs> oh. uh, this is book of mine, you know, lots of illustrations, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those. That's for sale. The museum makes a lot of money. You should buy one. <laughs> Maybe you would sign them. I will sign them if you want to sign them. But I think, you know, it's full of beautiful colored pictures. You, know, you can see, you know, look at these gorgeous pictures. <laughs> and and it's, it's basically, I mean, in all honesty, it's being sold at almost the cost it's being made even though it's like a loss in terms of finance, so it's not it's like a big money maker or anything like that. Anyway, it's available upstairs, and there's a oh, big polio picture on the front. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the Jewish community. Well, then, thank you very much. I'm glad you came.